The following is a recording of the annual Olaf Palm Memorial Lecture, given by Noam Chomsky at the Sheldonian Theatre in Oxford, May the 20th, 2004. A major area power failure caused the first 15 minutes of the recording to be lost. Subsequent recordings were made with backup battery equipment. Uh, the issue is much more serious now than in the past, first of all, because of the growth of rivals, uh, but also uh, because the Gulf region is becoming more and more significant. Uh, U.S. intelligence projections are that uh, in the next several decades, uh, it will be even more essential as a source of energy than in the past. Uh, it will, they estimate, uh, account for about two-thirds of the world energy reserve, and therefore the need to control this dependent source of strategic power uh, becomes even more significant than before. And in comparison with that, uh, killing thousands of Americans is a uh, minor affair. So there really shouldn't be any surprise that uh, terror should be downgraded uh, in favor of the invasion of Iraq. Uh, and there also shouldn't be any surprise that uh, the Wolfowitz and Rumsfeld and Cheney, or Blair and Straw, are prepping, have been prepping the intelligence services to provide them with some shred of evidence uh, that could be used to uh, justify the invasion. Anything would do for the Iraqi link to terror, or weapon of mass destruction, anything as long as it, uh, it justifies this very important action. And a kind of rather striking fact that as one pretext follows another, and the earlier one collapses, uh, the uh, commentary among Western intellectuals follows along very obediently. Uh, we sort of forget about the last one, now we focus on the next one. Uh, always, almost always, near universally, as far as I can tell, uh, avoiding the obvious reason for the invasion, which is unmentioned, uh, namely the one I just mentioned. The obvious reason, but unless you're you know, way out on the fringes, you're not allowed to say that, and if you do say it, you're a conspiracy theorist or something. Uh, this uh, ritual avoidance of anthropologists call it of the obvious uh, is uh, not, it, it, though it's overwhelmingly true in the West, uh, there are exceptions. Uh, one of them is Iraq. Uh, there are uh, extensive, <coughs> extensive Western holes in Iraq, and uh, one recent one that happened to be in Baghdad. Uh, people were asked why they thought the U.S. invaded, and almost everyone uh, thought that the motive for the invasion was to control Iraq uh, resources and to reorganize the, the Middle East in U.S. interests. Uh, in other words, the obvious reason. Uh, and it's not unusual for people at the wrong end of the club to have a much more accurate uh, perception of reality than the ones who are holding the club. Uh, well, there are plenty of other current illustrations of the uh, fact, uh, obvious enough in Baghdad, that terror is regarded as a minor problem uh, in comparison with ensuring that the Middle East region uh, is properly disciplined. Actually, a very revealing example of that uh, just took place last week. Uh, the president uh, implemented uh, sanctions against uh, Syria. Uh, that's an implementation of the Syria Accountability Act that was passed by Congress uh, last December, virtually a declaration of war passed almost unanimously. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, if you look into the background, you see that this is a clear demonstration of the downgrading of the significance of the war on terror as compared to running the region. Uh, Syria is on the official list of states sponsoring terror, uh, despite the acknowledgement by the CIA, uh, there, there is no credible evidence of any Syrian involvement in terror for at least 15 years, even by U.S. standards. Uh, and uh, furthermore, uh, 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 the, uh, uh, just to show how serious the concern about Syrian sponsorship of terror is, uh, Clinton actually offered Syria uh, 
that to take it off the list of states sponsoring terror if Syria would agree to U.S.-Israeli proposal on uh, settlement of the, the Arab-Israeli crisis. Uh, Syria insisted on recovering its own conquered territory, and so it stayed on the list of states that sponsored terror. So it's something about that list, what that list means. Uh, actually, one country uh, in the since the list of states sponsoring terror was established, uh, one country has been removed from it, namely Iraq, in 1982, uh, when they were removed from the list of states sponsoring terror, so it permits the United States and Britain and others uh, to provide Saddam Hussein with uh, weapons and uh, aid and so on, while they carried out its most uh, atrocious crime. Uh, that support continued, in fact, uh, uh, while he crushed the Shiite rebellion in 1991. Uh, that, uh, uh, that, again, tells you something about the meaning of the uh, uh, war on terror. Well, uh, it goes on. Uh, when Syria was, when Iraq was removed from the list, it was gas. They put someone in. Uh, and uh, the state that was added uh, then to replace Saddam Hussein, was Cuba. Uh, perhaps that was in recognition of the fact that the uh, terrorist war that the United States has been carrying out against Cuba since the Kennedy years had just escalated before that to uh, previously uh, the new heights of international terrorism. Uh, the Syria Accountability Act is quite interesting, uh, now implemented by the President. It deprives the United States of a major source of information about the radical uh, Islamist terrorism. Syria had been very cooperative in all life of these people. Uh, they've been very cooperative in uh, uh, giving the U.S. information on uh, Islamic jihadis and others. Uh, but it's uh, more important to cut off that flow of information. Uh, that, uh, insignificant as compared with the need to ensure a uh, disciplined uh, Middle East, a uh, higher goal. That's not an unusual pattern, although it is rather striking that uh, comment on Western culture, but commentators continually find it surprising, uh, even though it's quite routine. Example after example of it, uh, no matter how strong the evidence, how regular the pattern, so it expresses surprise. Uh, ignoring that it's a quite rational choice on the basis of planners uh, and uh, has to do with entirely understandable and long-standing uh, planning priorities. There's plenty of evidence. Uh, the Syria Accountability Act of last December actually tells us more about the state priorities and prevailing doctrine. Uh, the uh, core demand of the Syria Accountability Act it refers to UN Security Council Resolution uh, 520, uh, which calls uh, for respect for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Lebanon. And that's violated by Syria uh, because it still has forces there uh, that were welcomed by the United States and Israel in 1976 uh, when they entered with the task of massacring Palestinians. That was okay. Uh, but now they're still there, and that violates uh, the Security Council resolution. Uh, however, the congressional legislation and news reporting uh, omitted the fact that Resolution 520 is directed against Israel, not against Syria. It's 1982, right after the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, and it demanded that Israel respect the territorial integrity uh, of the uh, of, of Lebanon by withdrawing. Of course, that was ignored because the U.S. supported the invasion. Uh, the, it also uh, overlooks the fact that Israel remained in violation of Resolution 520 uh, for uh, uh, about 20 years, almost 20 years, uh, with the support of the United States. Of course, there were never any sanctions proposed against Israel for violating Resolution 520, or for that matter, any call for reduction in the massive uh, military and economic aid that the United States uh, provides. Uh, furthermore, the legislators who voted 
uh, to uh, for the Theory Accountability Act because of uh, its violation of Resolution 520 uh, are the same ones, almost all of them, who simply ignored the fact that uh, Resolution 520 was disregarded by the country against whom it was directed uh, and was able to do so because the U.S. authorized the uh, uh, violation. That all passed in silence. Uh, the uh, operative principle is accurately formulated by one of the very rare scholarly critics, the only one I know, uh, Stephen Zunas. Uh, the principle is that, to put it, uh, Le Lebanese sovereignty must be defended only if the occupying army is from a country that the United States opposes, uh, but it is uh, defensible if the country is a U.S. ally. And that principle applies quite broadly uh, in, in various manifestations. It's another near historical universal, not just the United States, uh, kind of on the side. Uh, polls in the United States reveal that uh, by about two to one, uh, the U.S. population uh, favors an Israel Accountability Act, uh, holding Israel accountable for its development of weapons of mass destruction and human rights abuses in the occupied territory. So that, needless to say, is not on the agenda, uh, nor even for further uh, Well, there are many other quite striking illustrations of these priorities. Uh, so the Treasury Department has an office uh, called the uh, Office of Foreign Asset Control, OFAC, uh, which has a, its task is to investigate suspicious uh, international financial transfers. Now that's a core part of the so-called war on terror. Uh, OFAC has uh, 120 people devoted to this task. Uh, four of them uh, are uh, dedicated to the uh, finances of Saddam Hussein and Al-Qaeda. Uh, Twenty-one of them are dedicated to enforcing the uh, embargo against Cuba, uh, which has been condemned as illegal by every international forum, uh, but it's apparently five times as important to strangle Cuba as to uh, investigate the transfers of funds for Saddam Hussein and Al-Qaeda. Uh, in the years 1990 to 2003, end of 2003, uh, there were 93 terrorist-related uh, investigations and 11,000 Cuba-related investigations. Uh, the total fine for terrorist-related financial transactions, notice this goes two years beyond 9-11, uh, uh, the total amount is uh, $9,000. Uh, uh, the total for Cuba-related violations is $8 million. Uh, so why should the, the Treasury Department uh, be devoting so much more energy to strangling Cuba than to monitoring uh, uh, trying to fight the war on terror? Well, the answer to that is uh, quite simple. Uh, the United States happens to be an extremely open society, the most open and free in the world, as far as I know. So we know a lot about the uh, internal planning, a huge array of secret documents available, much more than here, uh, and uh, the answers are given uh, there. Uh, back in the Kennedy years, when the uh, terrorist war against Cuba took off, uh, uh, Arthur Schlesinger recorded in his uh, biography of Robert Kennedy, uh, the goal was to bring what he could call the terrors of the earth to Cuba. In fact, that was Robert Kennedy's uh, highest priority. Uh, at that time, a State Department planner uh, claimed, in their words, that the very existence of the Castro regime is successful defiance of U.S. policy going back 150 years. That means back to the Monroe Doctrine, that was declared that the United States would be the master of the hemisphere as soon as the United States was strong enough to get rid of its main enemy, which was England, uh, because that was the big military power which prevented the U.S. from conquering Canada and uh, taking over Cuba and so on. And they assumed sooner or later the balance of forces will shift, and the meaning of the Monroe Doctrine is we're going to run it when we get rid of the uh, deterrent. 
people these days. Uh, so, uh, 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 furthermore, it was pointed out, uh, in this case by Arthur Schlesinger, who headed the, uh, the Latin American mission for Kennedy, when he was the incoming president, uh, had a Latin American mission headed by Schlesinger. He presented a report, now it's classified, uh, in which he said that this successful defiance uh, in, uh, uh, may encourage others uh, who might be infected by what he called the Castro idea of taking matters into their own hands. Uh, and this danger is particularly grave uh, because uh, where the distribution of land and other forms of national wealth uh, greatly favors the property classes and the poor and underprivileged, uh, stimulated by the example of the Cuban Revolution, are now demanding opportunities for a decent living. Uh, well, that's a serious problem. Uh, and uh, if you look at history of the last 50 years and what are called Cold War interventions and so on, that's usually the reason uh, some other pretext is concocted. Uh, but uh, that's the reason when you look at the actual documentary record. And it makes sense then for successful defiance uh, to remain intolerable and to be ranked uh, uh, far higher as a priority than combating terror. Another illustration of principles that are uh, well established, uh, internally rational, clear enough to the victim, but inexpressible among the, uh, uh, the agents, uh, major uh, function of the intellectual classes, to keep quiet about this. The uh, clamor about the revelations of the Bush administration's priority and the current uh, hearings in Washington are just another illustration of this curious inability uh, to perceive the obvious, uh, even to entertain it as a possibility, no matter how well established it is. Well, turning to terrorism, uh, I should say now that uh, I'm going to follow a Western convention, which is deplorable, but universal, so I'll keep to it. Uh, the term terrorism uh, refers to terrorism that they carry out against us. It excludes terrorism that we carry out against them. So I'll keep to that unfortunate convention. Uh, there is a, uh, uh, a very broad consensus among specialists on terrorism in this sense on how to reduce the threat and also uh, on how to uh, incite a further terrorist atrocities. And sooner or later, they're going to become really horrendous. It's just a matter of time before terrorism and weapons of mass destruction are linked, and the consequences of that uh, you don't want to think about. Now, that's been obvious long before the 11th of September, discussed in technical literature right through the 90s. Uh, well, uh, the Iraq invasion is rather typical in this respect. Uh, violence quite commonly elicits a more violent response. Now, there are some detailed and quite good investigations of the Al-Qaeda phenomenon. The best one I know is by the British uh, journalist analyst Jason Burke, and he points out, as do others, uh, that, uh, uh, and we know from intelligence records now, that Al-Qaeda was virtually unknown and then Laden was a minor figure, uh, not taken very seriously, until Clinton bombed uh, the Sudan and Afghanistan in 1998. Uh, that led to a sharp increase in support and recruitment and financing for the Al-Qaeda style network. Uh, it turned bin Laden into a major figure for the first time. Uh, it also forged close links between Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. Uh, previously, the, the relations were rather cool and quite hostile, but this brought them uh, together. Uh, uh, incidentally, we learned something about our own civilization from the reaction to the uh, Clinton bombing. Uh, in the Sudan, uh, Clinton destroyed roughly half the pharmaceutical supplies of a poor African country. Uh, if some terrorists blew up has the pharmaceutical supplies in some country that matters, say like the United States or England or Israel or someone else, uh, we pay attention to it. 
uh, in the case of the Sudan, it's of course much more harmful. It's a poor country, even under Goika, and the very few uh, credible uh, estimates of consequences are that it led to uh, tens of thousands of deaths. Uh, well, that's disregarded as usual. Uh, uh, but again, in fact, there's virtually no investigation and interest in that matter is non-existent, uh, at least typical. Uh, but again, the people at the wrong end of the club uh, tend to see the world uh, rather differently. Uh, actually, there are many other examples of this, and they're quite striking. It takes real talent to ignore them. Uh, so it takes Rwanda, for example. We've just commemorated the 10th anniversary of the terrible crime of the West in refusing to act during the hundred days of massacres in Rwanda. The killing to that period was about 8,000 people a day. It went on for a hundred days, so the West didn't do anything. And we're now in a great crime. The uh, fact of the matter is that uh, there are a killing at the Rwanda level, almost precisely, uh, it goes on daily in Africa just among children. Uh, the number of children who die every day from easily treatable diseases happens to be in the neighborhood of 8,000 a day. Now, that's not for 100 days. That's constantly. Uh, and our reaction is the same as Rwanda, actually worse. Uh, in the case of Rwanda, to do something about it would have required uh, military intervention, or something like that. Uh, in the case of the Rwanda-style killings, we go on daily, uh, not 100 days. Uh, all that's necessary is to bribe drug companies. Uh, in fact, it would amount to pennies. Uh, that's a lot easier than military intervention, uh, but it's not a it's not an issue. I and mean, we were perfectly happy to watch uh, Rwanda-style level killing going on daily, just among children. And, one part of the world uh, and not do something as simple as bribing drug companies to provide the treatment. And so that tells us something else. Now, the very idea that the only way to deal with this is to bribe huge private tyranny uh, tells us something more about the uh, deep savagery of our institutions. That's uh, another problem, not for this today. In any event, these cases like the bombing of Sudan are quite typical. Uh, including the lack of interest. Well, after uh, Clinton's bombings in 1998, uh, the next major contribution to the uh, growth of Al-Qaeda uh, was the uh, uh, attack on Afghanistan that had no credible pretext, as was later quietly conceded. Uh, that led to a sharp increase, again, in recruitment and enthusiasm for what was coming to be called uh, the cosmic struggle between good and evil. And that's the rhetoric shared by Ben Laden and uh, President Bush's uh, speech writer. I assume that Ben Laden writes his own oration. Uh, the uh, most careful and detailed study I know of this is Jason Burke, I guess I'm kind of paraphrasing it. Uh, he uh, concludes, he puts it, that every use of force is another small victory for Ben Laden. And that conclusion is very widely shared among terrorism analysts and the intelligence agencies. In particular, it's shared by Israeli intelligence in their own country. So the uh, now retired uh, heads of military intelligence and the general security services who, since they're retired, speak uh, almost consistently point this out in their, in their own context. Uh, and uh, uh, there are uh, uh, new illustrations of this almost every day. Uh, so take, for example, the recent uh, horrors in Fallujah. Uh, the Marine invaded Fallujah. Actually, what happened there is far worse than the atrocities that are on the front pages about the prison abuse. Uh, the Marines invaded, but it's just normal, so it doesn't get mentioned. Uh, the, uh, this is the normal way in which the United States and Britain and others uh, treat the backwards people, so it doesn't really require any mention. Uh, the Marines invaded, they killed nobody knows how many people and nobody cares, uh, maybe hundreds, maybe more. Uh, the uh, 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 the uh, invasion and the massacre uh, was a response 
to the murder of four American security contractors in Fallujah. Uh, responsibility for that, that murder was taken by a new group uh, which called themselves Brigade of Martyr Ahmed Yassin. Uh, they were avenging the murder of a quadriplegic uh, cleric, uh, uh, Sheikh Yassin, and about half a dozen bystanders uh, as he left the mosque uh, in Gaza a few days before the Fallujah murder. Uh, this was reported in the United States and England as an Israeli assassination, but that's not quite accurate. Uh, Sheikh Yassin was killed by, by a U.S. helicopter. Uh, Israel does not produce helicopters. Uh, helicopters are sent to Israel with the understanding that that's the way they're going to be used. Uh, they're not used for defense, they're used for purposes like this. Uh, helicopters are sent uh, and used with U.S. authorization, it happened to be flown by an Israeli pilot, but it's a U.S. assassination. Uh, in the preceding six months before the Sheikh Yassin assassination, uh, so-called targeted assassination, according to Israeli statistics, uh, killed 50 suspects, suspects, no, killed 50 suspects and about 80 to 90 bystanders. That would be in the wrong place. Uh, none of this enters the annals of state terrorism uh, because of the agency. Uh, the United States is exempt by definition, and that exemption extends to the client. Uh, that's a crucial condition of the intellectual and moral culture, namely the powerful makes the rule. Uh, the question about that is rather as in the mafia, to which uh, international affairs uh, there's more than a passing resemblance. Well, going back to Fallujah, to trace the chain of violence, it leads directly from the uh, U.S.-Israeli assassination of Sheikh Yassin up to the conflagration in Iraq. Uh, all of this was known right away, uh, but uh, virtually silent, as far as I know, totally silent, in the media, in the United States at least, uh, where there's a more skeptical attitude towards media, and they're very carefully uh, investigated. Uh, there's also a broad consensus on how to reduce the threat of uh, terror. Uh, the, such a program would have to be too prompt. Uh, the terrorists themselves, uh, they see themselves as the vanguard. They're trying to mobilize their constituency. Uh, the proper, re and they're carrying out criminal acts, and the proper reaction to criminal acts is police action. Uh, which happens to be very successful. It's been quite successful in uh, Europe, uh, Southeast Asia, South Asia, uh, where serious police action has been taken. Uh, monitoring financial flows would also be effective if it's carried out, uh, but not if the Treasury Department is much more concerned with uh, strangling Cuba. Uh, the, uh, uh, but more important than the terrorists themselves uh, are the is the uh, constituency that to which they're trying to appeal. Uh, people who may uh, fear them and even hate them, uh, but nevertheless recognize that their cause is somehow right and just, even if they don't like them and are afraid of them. Uh, and uh, here there's two choices. Uh, we can help the terrorists mobilize the, the uh, constituency by carrying out acts of violence, or we can pay some attention to the grievances of the constituency, which are often quite legitimate and should be dealt with quite apart from any relation to terror. I mean, everyone here knows that. That's just what recently happened in Northern Ireland. Uh, as long as England responded to IRA terror by violence, it was a gift to the most militant elements of the IRA. I love it. Uh, it uh, mobilized the constituency, led to more terror. Uh, when England finally got the right idea of paying some attention to the grievances, which are legitimate, uh, that reduced the terror. Uh, and in fact, uh, Northern Ireland is a much more peaceful place than it was a few years ago. Now, utopia, but it's much better than it was. And that's pretty consistent. Uh, I should uh, mention, perhaps, that uh, IRA terror was financed from the United States. In fact, from where I live, uh, Boston was the center of financing for IRA terror. 
uh, collections in churches and so on. The uh, FBI knew all about this, uh, counterterrorism experts uh, write about it, uh, but they didn't interfere, and they say that it would have been impossible to interfere, so it went on. Uh, now, however, such measures are demanded of Saudi Arabia, uh, and apparently carried out with some success. So somehow in their case, it's possible. Uh, but in the case of the United States, this was impossible. And it's the usual story. It depends whose ox is being gored. Uh, that determines what's possible and what isn't. Uh, uh, well, uh, the violence can defeat. I don't mean to suggest that it's going to fail. And there are many examples of that, too. The fate of the uh, indigenous population of the United States is a dramatic example of that. And millions of them were just exterminated by English colonists and those who followed them. Uh, and, uh, and there's many other cases. Uh, it's kind of interesting to notice how that one's treated. If you time, I'll come back to it. Uh, but ignore it, it's denied. Uh, so ter the violence can succeed, uh, but usually at a tremendous cost. It can often provoke greater violence in response, and it often does. Uh, inciting terror is an example, but it's by no means the most serious example, serious current example, a much more important one. Uh, one of them was, again, dramatically illustrated a couple of months ago. Uh, two months ago, the Russians carried out their biggest uh, military exercises in two decades, uh, displaying uh, new and more sophisticated uh, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, they made it clear that this was the direct response to Bush administration uh, aggressiveness and uh, uh, militarism, and, uh, and that had been predicted by every analyst. Of course, they knew the Russians were going to respond that way. Uh, one prime example that the Russian leadership brought up uh, was Washington's development of what are called low-yield nuclear weapons, some benign, except that the Russians know, as well as U.S. strategic analysts do, that those weapons are targeting Russian command centers uh, hidden in mountains, like the U.S. command centers, uh, and uh, vulnerable, they hope, to uh, what are called bunker busters, low-yield nuclear weapons that are supposed to deep penetration. And that would uh, destroy the Russian deterrent. So, of course, they're going to act to overcome that. Uh, Washington's insistence on using space uh, for offensive military purposes, uh, including first strike, incidentally, that's another major concern. Uh, U.S. analysts are now uh, expecting that the Russians are duplicating current U.S. developments of uh, hypersonic uh, cruise vehicles. That's a hypersonic vehicle that can orbit in space and suddenly enter the Earth's atmosphere uh, without warning. Uh, and unleash a devastating lethal attack uh, anywhere. The U.S. is developing them, and the U.S. analysts suspect that the Russians are uh, doing so as well. Now, U.S. analysts also estimate that uh, the Russian military expenditures have approximately tripled during the Bush uh, years. Uh, the uh, Russians have officially adopted uh, the Bush doctrine of so-called attack, meaning aggression at will, the revolutionary new doctrine that depressed uh, Kissinger. Uh, the Russians are also relying on automated response systems. Uh, we know that in the past, uh, these have come literally within minutes, two minutes in one case, of uh, uh, launching a nuclear strike uh, with a misidentified uh, uh, computer analysis. Once it was aborted by human intervention two minutes before launch, that was in the end of the world. Uh, that was 10 years ago. Uh, by now, the Russian systems have deteriorated, U.S. analysts assume, uh, because of the uh, part of the collapse of Russian economy under the uh, uh, market uh, fanaticism of the last year. Well, we know a lot about U.S. systems, as usual. Uh, U.S. automated response systems allow three minutes for human judgment uh, after computers warn of a missile strike, which is apparently a daily occurrence, uh, according to U.S. analyst reports. 
Uh, after that follows a 30-second a, a presidential briefing. So if the, <laughs> missile, if the computers identify a missile strike, it apparently happens to that every day, it's three minutes of human analysis, 30 seconds for President Bush to make a decision. Uh, Pentagon analysts have also found a very serious design flaw uh, in the uh, computer security system. That should not surprise anyone who knows anything about complicated software. It's almost universal for anyone with a computer, for that matter. Uh, the uh, design flaws, according to the Pentagon, could permit terrorist hackers uh, to break into the system and simulate a launch. Uh, that's uh, an accident waiting to happen, one leading U.S. strategic analyst warned. Uh, the Russian systems are far less reliable. Uh, and notice that these dangers are being consciously escalated. These are the predicted reactions to the massive increase in military spending and development of new destructive military technology. The, conscious, the dangers are consciously being escalated. And in this case, uh, we're not talking about terrorism, we're talking about the survival of species, quite literally. Uh, right now, the United States is beginning to deploy a missile defense system uh, deployed this summer in time for the presidential election. Uh, there's a lot of criticism of that uh, because it's so obviously done for partisan political purposes and also because it's using untested technology, which probably won't work, uh, at a huge expense. Uh, that criticism may be accurate, but it's the wrong criticism. Uh, the right criticism is that it might work or at least it might look as though it might work. Because remember, in the logic of nuclear war, what matters is perception, not reality. And if there's any possibility that it might work, potential targets have to make a worst-case analysis. Uh, and uh, uh, they know perfectly well, as the uh, U.S. analysts do, that missile defense is a first strike weapon. Its purpose is to enlarge the domain of potential aggression without concern for a possible reaction. So they, in fact, the U.S. and Chinese analysts use the very same word to describe missile defense. They call it a sword, not a shield. Uh, and that's well understood. And of course, they're going to react accordingly. But if you want to know how they'll react, there's some recently classified U.S. records on the U.S. reaction to Russia's deployment of a very small ABM system around Moscow in 1968. It turns out the U.S. reacted exactly as you would predict, namely by targeting the system with nuclear weapons and also tar targeting the radar installation uh, that might provide information with uh, more nuclear weapons. Uh, well, the current U.S. plans are expected to provoke a similar Russian response. Uh, although, uh, of course, it's now on a far larger scale. Uh, China is even more serious case. A, a China has virtually no nuclear deterrent. Supposedly has about 20 missiles. Uh, a missile defense system, which looks as if it has any possibility of working, essentially eliminates the Chinese deterrent. And, of course, they're going to react by increasing their offensive uh, capacity of weapons of mass destruction. As China does that, India has to react. Uh, as India reacts, Pakistan has to react. And the ripple effect extends. All predictable, all understood. All you have to do is read the technical literature. Everyone points it out. Uh, there is, in fact, a concern in the United States uh, about the, these effects, you know, the China, India, Pakistan effect. Uh, however, there's very little discussion in the United States, in fact, essentially none, about the threat that's coming from West Asia. Uh, Israel's nuclear capacity, uh, supplemented with other weapons of mass destruction, are regarded as, quoting, dangerous in the extreme by the former head of the uh, U.S. Strategic Command, part of the military that's concerned with uh, weapons of mass destruction, General Lee Butler. Uh, dangerous in the extreme because of the threat they pose, uh, but also because they elicit uh, proliferation in reaction to the standard cycle. Uh, 
uh, the United States is now increasing that threat consciously and eliciting a potential reaction. The uh, Israeli uh, Air Force, according to its own analysts, is larger and uh, technologically more advanced than any NATO power, including England, any NATO power apart from the United States, of course, uh, not because Israel is a powerful country, but because it's a, an offshoot of the U.S. military system. And as such, it can have an air force which is more advanced than any NATO power and larger. And the United States is now enhancing that threat. Uh, right now, the uh, uh, U.S. Bush administration is sending uh, over 100 of its most advanced jet bombers, uh, F-16Is, uh, with a very clear announcement uh, that these can fly to Iran and back, carry out bombing missions there. It's also pointed out in the military journals and so on that these are updated versions of the F-16, U.S. F-16, that Israel used to bomb the uh, Iraqi of Iraq reactor in 1981. The fairy tale among an intellectual commentary is that that bombing uh, held back a Saddam Hussein's uh, nuclear uh, weapons program. In fact, it was known right away that it initiated his uh, weapons program. The Osirak reactor was infected right after the bombing by the head of the uh, Harvard Physics Department, uh, uh, Richard Wilson, a specialist on nuclear reactors, and he pointed out that it was simply uh, incapable of, of uh, weapons production. Now, that was reported, you can read it in Nature, for example, in a technical article and elsewhere. Uh, we know now from Iraqi detectors and others uh, that the Iraq reacted as you'd expect by initiating a nuclear weapons program. So that's when it began. Uh, but that we're supposed to forget. Uh, the, uh, according to the Israeli press, this is only in the Hebrew edition. They don't translate it. Uh, the U.S. is providing Israel with what they call special weapons for the new advanced uh, jet fighters that are aimed at Iran. Well, Iranian intelligence has to make a worst-case effort. I mean, they, of course, read this naturally. Uh, the, uh, in fact, it's published so that they will read it. Uh, and they, again, have to make the worst-case analysis that these may be uh, nuclear-tipped uh, uh, missiles for the uh, advanced jet bombers that can fly to Iran and back. Uh, what's that all about? Well, you know, we have to speculate here. Uh, the purpose may be to incite uh, some Iranian uh, action that will serve as a pretext for, uh, for an attack, or it may be just to sort of uh, rattle the leadership, uh, maybe contribute to uh, internal uh, conflict and chaos, uh, but whatever the intent, it's obvious what the consequences are. So those are all major threats to uh, proliferation in an extremely dangerous area, which can easily escalate into uh, global nuclear war, uh, like lighting the oil with a match. And that's well understood. Uh, but it doesn't matter. Uh, you do it anyway. But there are higher priorities than survival of species, uh, short term <laughs> power gain. Now, that's not new either. That runs through history. What's new is the scale of the consequences. But the character of the choices will, will run right through history. It's a striking example. Uh, well, the collapse of the pretext for invading Iraq is quite familiar. Uh, but not enough attention has been given to the most important consequence of the collapse of the pretext. Remember, the original Bush Blair doctrine is that the U.S. has the right uh, to uh, attack a country if it has weapons of mass destruction uh, and uh, links to terror. Okay, that's gone. Uh, the connection, the uh, links to terror argument has been quietly dropped. Uh, the weapons of mass destruction argument give anymore. Uh, so the doctrine has in fact been changed officially. Uh, uh, Powell, uh, Blair, uh, Pentagon leaders and others uh, now say that the U.S. has the right to attack a country if it has, I'm quoting, the intent and ability to develop weapons of mass destruction. 
structure. Okay. Who has the ability? Well, any country with a high school chemistry and biology lab <laughs> infrastructure has the ability. But who has the intent? Well, that's for Paul Wolfowitz to decide. Uh, <laughs> what that means is that the new doctrine is far more dangerous than the old one. It now says uh, that the United States has a right to attack anyone at will uh, without warning uh, with advanced weaponry. And in fact, the, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the uh, capability to uh, uh, carry out these announced plans are being enhanced by new military, the new program. The Clinton program was aimed at what was called the control of space for military purposes. And that means any place that owns space, uh, everyone is at risk of attack, always with destructive weaponry. Uh, well, the World Intelligence Agency can read the, the Air Force Space Command Strategic Master Plan, uh, from which I've been quoting, uh, just as easily as I can, uh, and you can too if you like, it's on the web, uh, not a secret, and they can draw the appropriate conclusion, uh, and they will, uh, increasing the risk to all of us. And again, uh, the best history, including quite recent history, offers many examples of leaders consciously enhancing a very serious threat uh, in pursuit of narrow power interests. Uh, happens that now uh, the stakes are much higher, but the process is common. Uh, so it's true that uh, 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 the cycle works. We carry out violence, we threaten violence, we want to enhance the threat of violence. You're much more serious. Well, the collapse of the pretext for the invasion, familiar, uh, it did lead to a new doctrine. It turns out that the war in Iraq was inspired by the president's the messianic vision to bring democracy to Iraq. I'm quoting the elite uh, liberal press in the United States, and in fact the whole world. And the president affirmed the messianic vision uh, in an address last November. So that was the real reason. Uh, the re I have not surveyed the reaction in England, but the reaction in the United States uh, ranged from reverential awe uh, which proves that this was the noblest war in history, as the Washington Post uh, leading veteran correspondent included, uh, to criticism. And the criticism is interesting. Uh, the criticism presupposes that it's true, uh, but says it may not work. Uh, maybe it's beyond their means, or uh, the beneficiaries are too backward, or they don't observe, you know, deserve it, or something like that. But that this is the motive for the invasion is simply presupposed in news reporting and commentary. Uh, so, quote uh, the London Economist, uh, America's mission of turning Iraq into an inspiring example of democracy for its neighbors is facing problems. That's a typical sort of uh, kind of a useful exercise I recommend it to you to find some evidence that the invasion was inspired by the messianic vision. Well, if you try, you'll discover uh, that uh, there is uh, crucial evidence, namely our leaders declare it, and therefore it's true, and it's unquestionably true, because it presupposes. If you can find any more evidence that's uh, interested in hearing it, uh, it's also necessary to suppress the fact that by declaring that this is the vision, our leader and the commentators who take it seriously uh, also happen to be saying that Bush and Blair are among the most impressive liars in history, uh, because when they were mobilizing their country for war, that wasn't the reason. Uh, the reason was, uh, as they put it, that the single question is whether Iraq will eliminate its weapons of mass destruction. Well, now what they're telling us, look, we were lying all the way through. Uh, the real reason was the messianic vision. And it's interesting to notice that the intellectual classes accepted without a murmur. Uh, actually, I, I did find one exception, I should say, in the Washington Post. Uh, a few days after the uh, president uh, revealed his messianic vision, his great applause, uh, the Washington Post published a, uh, a U.S.-run poll, the results of a U.S.-run poll in Baghdad, one I mentioned earlier. 
Uh, people were asked why they thought the U.S. invaded Iraq, and some of them did agree with about 100% of articulate, educated opinion in the West, but mainly 1%. 1% believed that the goal was to bring democracy to Iraq. 5% uh, uh, thought that the goal was to help Iraq. Uh, the rest gave the obvious answer, the one that's inexpressible in the West. Uh, well, Iraqis don't have to know American history uh, to draw the conclusions about noble vision. They have their own history, which suffices. You know, of course, that Britain created modern Iraq with boundaries uh, to ensure that Britain, not Turkey, would get the oil of the north, and that Iraq would have no access to the sea, so it would be dependent. That's what the principality of Kuwait is for. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the, it was done with very noble rhetoric, like everything is. So Iraq was going to be independent, a nice constitution, uh, nice constitution so everything is beautiful. Uh, meanwhile, the British uh, Foreign Office records, uh, declassified, I think, 60 years later, uh, show what you'd anticipate that uh, Lord Curzon and the Foreign Office uh, were proposing for Iraq and the rest of the region that Britain should establish what they called an Arab facade, uh, that Britain would rule behind various constitutional fictions. Okay, well, Iraqis didn't have to wait for the declassification of British records uh, to <laughs> guess this. They had a little history to tell them. Uh, and uh, furthermore, they can see what's happening right before their eyes, right now. So uh, on the diplomatic front, uh, the United States is establishing in one of Saddam Hussein's major palaces uh, the biggest embassy in the world, probably a couple of thousand employees. Uh, we're told that's the transfer sovereignty to Iraq, a plausible argument. Uh, the uh, embassy is headed by John Negroponte, confirmed by the Senate, which is an interesting choice. Uh, the Wall Street Journal had an article about it in which they described him as a modern pro consul who learned his trade in Honduras in the 1980s, that's during the Reaganite phase of the current administration in Washington. Uh, in Honduras, he was known as the pro consul, that's what the American ambassador is in a Central American country, uh, and he uh, presided over the second largest embassy in Latin America and the biggest CIA station in the world. Now that's because Honduras is such a centerpiece of world power. Uh, well, what was his job? His main job was to supervise the bases from which the U.S. mercenary army was attacking Nicaragua in a devastating attack which practically destroyed the country. Uh, that led to the U.S. being condemned for international terrorism by the World Court or to terminate the crime after which it was, of course, escalated. Uh, it went to the Security Council. There are two Security Council resolutions supporting the uh, World Court decision. The U.S., of course, vetoed them. It's written politely abstained, as practice is. Uh, and uh, uh, Negroponte's task was to supervise the states. Uh, well, you know, again, Iraqis really don't have to know American history to know this. They have their own experience. Uh, but they can see the meaning of the embassy. Uh, there are also uh, uh, military forces in base. That's a major bone of contention right now. Who is the U.S. military going to be able to establish a permanent presence in Iraq and to control the Iraqi security forces? Uh, well, Paul Wolfowitz, who he called in the press, I should say, the elite press, the idealist in chief of the uh, Bush administration, the visionary leading the crusade for democracy. Uh, there's no time, but he has an absolutely incredible record of visceral hatred of democracy. It's hard to find anyone like it. Uh, anyhow, he's the idealist in chief, and he announced that uh, the U.S. must maintain a prolonged troop presence and a weak Iraqi army under U.S. control because that's necessary to nurture democracy. Uh, uh, so that's why we have to run the army. Uh, it doesn't uh, matter that Iraqis overwhelmingly uh, favor uh, uh, want Iraqis to run to be in charge of security, uh, as the U.S. was recently forced uh, to uh, accept in Fallujah. 
Uh, not all. There are some Iraqis who agree with Paul Wolfowitz. That seven percent uh, think that U.S. forces should run the security system. Five uh, percent think that the U.S. appointed the governing council should. Uh, but all of this is irrelevant to the messianic vision. Well, in addition to the diplomatic component and the military component, the Iraqis are well aware of the economic program uh, instituted by the current pro-consul, Paul Bremer. Uh, without going into detail, these effectively open uh, uh, Iraqi industry and banking to uh, U.S. takeover. The Britain will get a few crumbs worry about it. So there'll be a few British companies that will be allowed in, but basically U.S. paper. Uh, 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 the, uh, Bremer also imposed a 15% top tax. That turns Iraq, forgetting injustice, it turns Iraq into the one, one of the least taxed countries in the world, which means it'll be unable to carry out the desperately needed reconstruction of infrastructure and uh, social spending. These plans, incidentally, were instantly denounced by Israeli, Iraqi business representatives who pointed out that it's going to destroy them, which is familiar. Uh, there are fewer problems with Iraqi workers. Uh, the occupying army, the Iraq happens to have a fairly militant labor tradition, uh, but the occupying army immediately took action to destroy the union, uh, broke into offices, arrested leaders, blocked strikes, uh, imposed Saddam's very harsh anti-labor laws and handed concessions over to uh, U.S. Uh, uh, businesses which are known for their extreme anti-union position. Uh, those economic measures, incidentally, are quite familiar. They played a very large role in creating the Third World, where they were imposed by imperial force, uh, uh, while uh, England and uh, the United States and Germany and everybody else every other country that developed and followed a very different course. Uh, market discipline is for the weak and defensive. Uh, the rich and powerful rely on massive uh, state intervention right at the core of the economy for England and everyone who is present. Uh, the U.S. economy today uh, relies crucially uh, on uh, uh, the dynamic state sector, uh, which has created virtually the entire uh, new economy, as it's called. Uh, I think it's true, and see that that's pretty obvious. Uh, and in the case of Iraq, it will presumably have the same effect. Well, it's an open question whether uh, Iraqis can be coerced into submitting to the messianic vision with nominal sovereignty uh, offered under various constitutional fictions. Uh, for privileged uh, Europeans and Americans, however, there's a much more important question and that is whether they will permit their government to nurture democracy in the style of the idealists in chief, uh, as they do throughout their traditional domains of power and influence. And right at this point, uh, very crucial questions arise about the nature of industrial democracy and its future. And these are extremely important questions, the survival of the species of the state, but that's for some other time when electricity is working. <laughs>
may help this folks. Oh, it may help. I'll probably need it after three days more speaking later. Yeah, Um, I think this, this catalogue is 
given us some of lies and deception and complicity is, is incredibly impressive, but it's also deeply depressing, I think. Um, and I would be interested to ask, do you see any limits to the power of the United States? Are there circumstances under which this model could cease to work, or it could collapse? Or are there forces within within the world, within the Western democracies, within the Western world, that could bring it to collapse? Oh, yeah. And, and if so, what can we do to encourage them? I, I think <laughs> what's happening in Iraq is very hopeful in this respect. Now, just take a look at the historical perspective. Now, to compare it today, say, with 40 years ago, uh, when Kennedy had stopped Vietnam, it was public. You know, in 1962, the U.S. Air Force started to bomb South Vietnam. A chemical warfare was initiated to destroy the crop. Uh, they began the program that drove millions of people into what amount of concentration camps. South Vietnam was the target. You know, no North Vietnamese troops just wanted to leave the, the Vietnamese had the right to be in Vietnam for whatever reason. Uh, it was called the, a defense of South Vietnam against internal aggression. Uh, the official term, uh, meaning they're resisting the U.S. takeover. Uh, there's no protest whatsoever in the United States, uh, England, Europe, anywhere else. And in fact, protests didn't really, I, I remember those days very well, I was giving talks in churches to three people, things like that. Uh, you simply couldn't arouse any interest. Nobody cares. Uh, it's just standard, that's the European way and the American way, we smack up anyone in the American way. And it was years, literally years, in fact, uh, before any visible process developed. Uh, by the time it did, uh, South Vietnam, which was always the main target of the attack, had practically been destroyed. Uh, Bernard Paul, the French military historian, was quite off incidentally, he was the leading recognized specialist. In 1967, uh, he predicted that the Vietnam as a cultural and historical entity will cease to exist under the U.S. assault. Uh, well, that was after five years of war, and protest was just beginning. Uh, finally, it built up, and you know, various things happened. But by then, Vietnam was essentially destroyed. Uh, well, compare now. Uh, in uh, February 2003, for the first time in centuries, European history, I think it's the first time, there were massive protests against the war before it started. I can't think of another case. Uh, same in the United States. And what we're seeing in, in Iraq right now is an indication of it. If this was 1962, nothing would stop the United States from just wiping the country out. Okay, this time there are constraints. And that comes from inside. Population won't tolerate it anymore. Uh, and then you know it. I mean, they uh, do this really, you know, leak secret documents so they understand that uh, you have to win wars decisively and rapidly because the population is not supporting anything else. So they're forced to pull back and pull those jobs. Of course, make compromise, of course, to give up their uh, demands. It's not at all clear that they're going to be able to achieve the war aim of establishing permanent military bases in the dependent client states. That's now beginning to look unlikely. Well, you know, that's a big change from 40 years ago. And it's the result, uh, and to a large extent, it's just the result of their actual refusal to accept, uh, uh, to accept the, uh, you know, the, the forceful and imposition of false sovereignty. Uh, but to, a, to an extent, it's uh, due to an increase in the level of civilization in the West. People won't tolerate what they tolerate in the past. And uh, this shows up in many different ways. I mean, look, uh, all of our societies are much more civilized than they were 40 years ago. I mean, just that every respect. I take something like the right to women. That's totally different than it was 40 years ago. Uh, when I was last in Oxford, first in Oxford in the 60s, uh, I'll tell you what it was like. Uh, MIT, my own university, was the same way. Uh, white, male, well-dressed, uh, obedient, and uh, so on. Now, half women, third minority, casually dressed, informal relations. Uh, and that's everywhere. So that's an increase in the level of civilized value. And it shows up in opposition to aggression, in support for in solidarity movements, 
uh, in the 1980s in the United States, uh, something totally new happened in the entire history of imperialism. People from the imperial power, thousands of them, uh, went to live with the victims to try to help them and protect them. Try to think of a case like this. And how many people from France who went to uh, live in Algeria villages to help to protect the people with a white face against the uh, French French run terror? Or how many people went to Vietnam? It was unheard of. But in the 1980s, it was only tens of thousands of people went there. And it was interesting where they came from. Now, they weren't coming mostly from the Avid University. They were coming from the mainstream. Actually, a lot of them were Christian evangelicals. Or they were coming from the Midwest, the rural areas in the Southwest. You know, this was in part a reaction to the uh, enormous effects of liberation theology, which spread throughout the country. And in fact, remember, uh, uh, the church, Catholic Church, became put the prime enemy of the U.S. war in 1980. Uh, that's why it's fascinated artists, it's fascinated to intellectual, the priests, the nuns. In fact, if you look at the famous school of the Americas, you know, trained Latin American authors, they're proud of it. Uh, one of their advertising points is quoting it, that the U.S. Army helped defeat liberation theology. And that's their official talking point. Uh, and it's right. I mean, liberation theology was a turn in the Catholic Church, first time in its history, that the level of the Latin America, the Church uh, adopted what was called the preferential option for the poor. They were going to work for the poor instead of the rich. And that's a huge change in the history of the Church. And of course, that's not accepted. I mean, that's you know, for obvious reasons. So that's what they did in the main end. Uh, you want to talk about a class of civilization. The real class of civilization in the 1980s was uh, the United States to the British help against the Catholic Church. Uh, and, uh, but literally tens of thousands of people from very mainstream sectors in the United States that went there. Many of them are still there. But by now it's become an international solidarity movement. And there are people in the West Bank, all over Colombia, you know, all over the place. Uh, this, these are new jobs. The European imperialism never had anything like that. Maybe a few people here and there, but uh, there is never a popular movement. Well, okay, that's another sign of increasing civilization. And there's plenty more. All of that is uh, reason for hope. And opportunity, more important, is opportunity to develop uh, beyond that. I have easily 10 or 12 people wanting to ask you questions. Would you like to hear a collection of questions and give us one final response? We have another 10 minutes, so would you rather carry on serially and go? Okay, whatever you think. Uh, um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll take five questions. One, two, three, was the most I four, and five. <laughs> uh, I don't like to look at the What happened to it? And now, uh, secondly, it would be extended to the American terrorism international into a very wide range of the terrorist response to American aggression. The question that I have is the question. One of the issues you define needs to be your version is that I even see the weakness of West Bank even scholarship to the sense of the space of the time to break the civil order. I don't know the last question. This is, well, all right, I'll make it two more because I think you were the first time with that. Yes, please. And then the one last question. I'd like to try and get a bunch of your reactions to the opinion on the 
Okay, let me, I'll be very... What is one woman, but it's hard to admit, and I think in you, very unsatisfied, can I keep asking this question? Well, I'm not going to hear it. What is the role of the in Malaysia and the Ministry of Nationality that you described? If they have a role, how is it going to run around? What is that going to have on the part of the month? Okay. Okay. Well, I understand the strategy of putting them all together. It'll <laughs> overcome my unfortunate tendency to go on too long. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I won't be able to answer those. Just a word on each. I'll go backwards and it's easier. Uh, the role of Central Asia is secondary to the Persian Gulf. In fact, uh, it's tertiary. It's, uh, it's an important set of resources and uh, uh, raw materials, energy, and others. And there's a lot of struggle going on. Uh, very much like the Gulf region, far more important, as to who's going to control it. So if you take a look at the struggle about where the pipelines are going to go, um, are they going to the U.S. has a very definite idea. It wants the pipeline to go to the West, not to the East, not to China. Um, uh, and it wants them to go through U.S. on the territory. So not through Iran, not through Russia. We've got to snake around if you know, look at the map. So the U.S. maintains control of it. That's the same point. Uh, the U.S. is supporting some of the most brutal dictators in the world, uh, as is England, uh, because they have plenty of resources. Nothing new about that. Uh, it had nothing to do with the Messianic vision in Karamov and Uzbekistan, as a perfect example. So Central Asia is kind of like the Gulf region. It's not, that, not as important to them as resources. Uh, the privately owned business in space, uh, I mean, if the U.S. owned space, which it intends to do, it may allow uh, Bill Gates to take a ride. Okay, so, you know, it's called privately owned, but I think that's so that within the imaginable future. As to the lies and their significance, uh, there are plenty of lies, but I don't think there's any significance to it, because it's perfectly normal. I mean, just try to think of a case when that hasn't been true. Yeah, that's the way uh, our systems operate. There's no reason for them to say it's true. In fact, I, I've spent plenty of time looking at the class of records, U.S. and others. Anybody who's done that will uh, know something very obvious. The classification is not the security. There's very little that's classified as to the security. Most of it has to do with protecting the state against its major enemies, which is its own population. Uh, I, I think that's overwhelmingly true. He, if people get to know what's going on, power is in trouble. Not just the government, but also private terrorists, which in the modern world are very important. Corporations use private tyranny, mass economies to give them incredible rights, huge tax against lack of the liberal principles, all of this has to be kept quiet, so they have to be secret. Uh, so yes, there's plenty of lies, but that's normal, that's your job. Uh, the solution is just not to believe them, I suppose. Uh, we enjoy plenty of privilege, a tremendous amount of freedom, and all sorts of opportunities open to us. The Indian elections, uh, I mean, if Barbara's sitting here, I hesitate to talk about it, but uh, my guess is that the poor Indians, the overwhelming majority of Indians, 80% of India that Barbara writes about uh, didn't care, don't care one way or another what U.S. policy is and don't probably don't even know what it is. They have their own problems. 
right at home. And they're very weak. The Indian miracle that everyone talks about is a tiny percentage of the population. I just recommend a recent book to answer the rest of the question. Uh, as for uh, Western scholarship and intellectuals, again, there is nothing new about this. You take a look at the at intellectual, at the history, and the history of intellectuals is, of course, written by intellectuals. So they come out looking pretty good. <laughs> 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 good immediately to discuss it. And if you look at the actual history, it's quite short. Almost all, a few exceptions, but back to the classical Greeks and the Bible, the respected intellectuals, the privileged, respected ones, were the flatterers of the court. Or the ones who ask yourself how the prophets were treated in the Bible. Now, the word prophet is a mistranslation of an obscure Hebrew word. Uh, the prophets were what we would call this and this like it. When you take a look at their saying, that's what this and this like will say. Now, they weren't admired. You know, they were imprisoned, just driven into the dead, you know, punished. It's the flower of the court of the king who were admired. A uh, century later, the value is reversed, but not at the time. And if you look through history, it's what it always is. Uh, what can we do about it? Everything. That's us, after all. That's the world in which we live. And there's uh, you know, so many victories just in one uh, popular struggle that we really do have a, a tremendous amount of freedom and a lot of privilege, which means, and that confers responsibility and opportunity. So we know what we can do. The question is whether we want to do it. Uh, so I'm saying I don't know any more about anyone else uh, than anyone else. And we're waiting for probably they'll do something spectacular right before the election. <laughs> and, and, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if they know perfectly well where uh, some of the bottom is something conceivable that they can't figure out where he is somewhere in that little region. Uh, so probably he'll suddenly, uh, his court will suddenly emerge uh, on the eve of the Democratic Convention. And I presume something like that will happen to set up his hand. I might make one comment. Um, there are uh, studies of the Iraqi attitude towards this, and what they seem to want is that when Saddam Hussein goes on trial, uh, the uh, U.S. backers will be on trial as well. Uh, that's about as likely as the NASA hitting her. But unless you do something about it, there's a lot of them. I mean, you know, the, the way trials work ever since Nuremberg is that it's defeated or punished, not the victim. And never punished. In fact, the law is set up so it's exclusive. You probably know this. Uh, last, at the first question, who is to run the world and how? And that's really for us to discuss. You know, I mean, I got my own ideas. You know, talk about them, your ideas. Uh, but we really have that choice. Uh, my feeling is that the power should be dismantled. Uh, nation states are uh, monsters of invention. There's a reason why Europe was the most savage place in the world for centuries. They were trying to impose the nation state system in the region, and they just have no relation to people's concerns, interests, needs, relationships, and so on. And to try to impose that system was a very savage and brutal process. In fact, that helped Europe create the cultural savagery and the technology of destruction which enable them to do the same thing to the rest of the world and try to impose a nation-based system there. And if you look at the horrible conflicts going on around the world, most of them are red to the death. Well, you know, these are the sounds, they don't make any sense. Uh, I'm actually under investigation right now by the Turkish uh, State Security Services for uh, a speech that I made in Yarrow, in Southeast Turkey, Turkish region where I said something nice about the Ottoman Empire. Uh, but I, I said, you know, obviously we don't want to reconstitute the Ottoman Empire, but in some ways I said the right idea. Uh, thanks to the corruption of the Sultans and so on, corruption is very often a good thing, uh, they, didn't, they didn't have much of a, they left most people alone. So like the Greeks could run their affairs in one part of the city, I mean, to run their affairs, and everybody more or less got along, and there weren't any word posts. You go anywhere without a visa or anything like that. And that's probably the way the world would be organized. It's a natural way for the world to be organized. Well, that's one system of power. 
but there's a much more destructive system of power, and that's private tyranny. They are really pathological. In fact, Anglo-American law, its core principle, requires that corporations be absolutely pathological. Trying to win them, and they are, and they are very destructive. Uh, they are, and they, they also are massive interferences with the market. I don't know what to think about the market. Uh, they are commanding time. If you look at what's called world trade, I mean, Adam Smith would have called that trade. Uh, an awful lot of it, you know, maybe up to about three quarters, if you count out for it, and strategic alliances and so on, is actually going on internal commanding time. Uh, and uh, they are unaccountable. They are totalitarian. You know, their roots are approximately the same as the 20th century forms of totalitarianism. And since they are dedicated by law, to maximizing profit and power, irrespective of effect on any their legal responsibility, they're going to destroy it. They also essentially eliminate the political system. Uh, well, you know, they should be dismantled too. There's no reason for such illegitimate institutions to exist. Uh, and uh, we can go on, you know, uh, back down to the patriarchal family of international affairs, but that's really for you to decide. Uh, soft power is a nice term. There's nothing particularly novel about it. The imperial systems and power systems have tried in various ways to uh, you know, kind of look uh, benevolent and helpful and so on and so forth. And nowadays, uh, we call that soft power. Uh, and it's you know, better to be a benevolent slave owner than a murderous slave owner. Uh, but the real problem is uh, slave owners. You know, they are benevolent. Uh, and uh, I think you should look at it in that Thank you very much for coming.